welcome back to the implementation track at Eyes on Dry Eye 2022. I am your host for this track all weekend, Dr. Damon Durker. I am live from my studio here at Eye Searches of Indiana in Indianapolis. It's been a great event, lots of interaction, lots of great things going on in all three tracks. Glad that you're here. This is actually perhaps my highlight session of this evening because I get to do a one-on-one -on -one with one of my favorite people in the dry eye world. And she's just two hours down the road on I-74, uh, Dr. Carly Rose. So welcome, Dr. Rose. Uh, our topic is how to build your very own dream dry eye center. And what a better topic than this for you because you've actually done it. And I can't wait to hear how that process evolved over, over time in your practice in Cincinnati. Carly, welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Durker. Thank you for having me second year in a row. I am honored. And I did want to take a minute to thank the audience. I know there are a ton of other things you guys could be doing at 720 on a Friday night. And this is not a CE course. So literally the only benefit of you being here is to gain value. So I hope I'm going to bring that to the table in this little chunk of time we have. And I am honored. So let's get started. Like Dr. Durker said, my name's Carly Rose. I am in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I have two different practices a half a mile apart. I have a primary care um, typical optometry office, and then I just opened a dry eye med spa. So we are going to talk about, I was trying to brainstorm what we could talk about, right? So when Dr. Durker asked me to do this presentation, all he really gave me was an idea for a title. So we could literally talk about anything. And because it's unbranded and non-CE, we can literally talk about anything. So how I, I tried to brainstorm how I could add value for the amount of time we're going to exchange tonight. So I hope I do that. I wanted to first say that there is a chat box. Please use that feature. That's kind of why we're here is to have a little bit of a back and forth. And then here in a bit, we will have a poll. So what we're going to do is almost a choose your own adventure. If you ever read that style of book as a kid, I kind of wanted to do that here. I really wanted to talk about what you want to hear about. So the poll at the beginning is going to be an option of choices of topics to discuss towards the end. So utilize that poll if you have any opinion on what you want to hear tonight. So like Dr. Durker said, I morphed from private practice into truly a standalone dry eye clinic. So a little bit about my background is four years ago now, I purchased my sister's private practice. She opened an office cold and discovered that she did not, in fact, like the practice management side and the insurance and staffing and hiring and firing. She really just liked uh, the, the patient care side. I always knew I wanted to be a private practice owner, and so I actually had to convince her to sell it to me. It worked out beautifully, and almost right from the beginning, I started an internal dry eye clinic. So I have always been passionate about dry eye. I purchased my private practice. Within a few months, I purchased a LipaFlow and LipaScan, and it just has snowballed from there. We um, are only we were we are an only 750 square foot private practice office. So with two exam lanes and visual field and OCT and optos and a full optical, we were absolutely bursting at the seams. And so what you are watching here is a little walkthrough video of my solution to a very tight space limitation. I, um, I was hoping to expand my footprint of my private practice, but that wasn't an option. So within COVID, a half a mile down the street, the med spa you're seeing here was a day spa in my town and it never reopened from COVID. So I, over a series of events, came to end up renting this space and morphing it into a dry eye med spa and um, it's been a little bit of a wild ride. But what you can see here is I'm most excited about a lot of space. This is 3,300 square feet. 
And so my hope for it is to just grow and be able to advance within this rapidly evolving industry of dry eye. And so I found myself in private practice just wanting to continue to invest in different technologies and essentially not being able to because of a space constraint. So this is my solution to a space constraint that ended up being a happy accident because it has morphed into kind of something I would have never imagined had I continued to build it within my private practice. So if anyone joined us last year, my talk with Dr. Durker and Cam Solani was how to build a really rock solid dry eye clinic within your primary care setting. Now we have evolved to our next stage and it's a standalone dream dry eye center. So this is the time where I definitely want to start the poll. We are for sure going to talk about um, vision planning for if you want to launch a dry eye med spa or just a standalone dream dry eye clinic. We're going to talk about some financials and we're for sure going to talk about some technologies you can implement. The fourth topic we're going to talk about is your choice. So Dr. Durker, if you wanted to read the choices out. Dr. Rose, so we have the poll um, and the poll, we've actually had quite a few results already and we started the poll a couple minutes ago. 62% of our audience, which is a worldwide audience, by the way, if you um, just to remind everybody, this is, I don't know what time it is in South Africa or Australia, but we have people on this session right now. I think that's incredible. I did not know that this was global. So I would be very curious to see where everyone is right now in the chat box. And I want to see where the furthest away person is. This is fascinating. Furthest away person. Love it. So Let's we do have 61% um, said they wanted to start with their choose their own adventure as to what services you're actually offering in your dream dry eye center. So like in, in the aesthetic realm specifically? Dry eye aesthetics, 61% perfect. far so outweigh then, every other choice in that pool. Perfect. So instead of focusing on marketing or implementation, we will focus on aesthetics specifically. Awesome. Okay, so let me go ahead and get started on vision planning. I think of this as almost like the brainstorming phase, and I think it is so important. I often joke because I have a private practice office that I'm working in, and I have this kind of cold start dry eye med spa that is almost a whole new industry. It's been a wild ride. I've been telling people that it's like I have a toddler and an infant. The vision planning stage I'm talking about is the pregnancy, right? So my vision for this exact space has been going on for about four years now. I knew I wanted to go really deep in dry eye and become almost like a referral center and just make it an amazing patient experience. I had the vision of this space planned out to extreme detail four years ago, right? Um, what that includes is your why. We're going to talk about this in a second on the next page. And then you want a very robust business strategy. And I'm not talking about a business plan for the loans you're going to be getting. To me, that is um, kind of all fake, right? With that, you're writing down what you think the banks want to hear. What I'm talking about is your actual vision of your dream med spa or I keep saying that because that's my world, so sorry. I mean just dream dry eye clinic in general. It does not have to be specifically aesthetics or med spa. And what you wanna do with that is create a very detailed, maybe three to five page document on what the patient experience is, what services you offer, um, are, who are you marketing to? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? As many details as you can in this document. And then you want to take that and distill it down to your mission statement. So each of my mission statements at both of my locations took a lot of time, a lot of thinking, and a lot of staff participation, because I think that this piece of it is so important. When you're going down that this path, what's going to happen is you will have extreme highs and lows, right? Anyone that's in business knows this. 
And in the lows, you need to have something to fall back onto. And so you want this really clear mission on why you're doing this that will pull you through the downtimes. And so, like I mentioned, I really want this to be a value add for you guys, for me taking your time on this Friday night. So what I wrote down here are resources that I actually used during my, this whole journey. Um, you, it, I think it's very important to hire experts, especially if it's something you're not very familiar with or you're not comfortable with or you don't like doing, just hire it out. So with that, there's a company called Conscious Copy that will help you write your three to five page vision vision document, right? So farm out anything you don't feel comfortable with. If the idea of putting pen to paper to put your dreams out there in the world is intimidating, just hire it out and let people help you. With that same concept, I wanted to tell you guys that I have leaned on my business consultants from day one. I actually hired business consultants before I even purchased my practice because I knew that I basically knew nothing about business. And I'm so glad I did because things like COVID, how do you even navigate a global pandemic when you own a private practice and all the regulations that no one knows about? So Power Practice is my business consultants. I use them religiously. And then anything that's in quotations are books that I have read that actually helped this process for me. So I actually implemented what tools were in these resources. And I want to be very clear that most of these are available on audiobook. Most of them are free through your library on audiobook. You can listen to audiobooks on 2 and 3x, so you can burn through things very quickly. I think everything for you to succeed is out there and probably free. It's just a matter of actually doing the thing, right? So Start With Why and Find Your Why are both by Simon Sinek. If you want to dip your toes into Simon Sinek, he has a viral TED Talk that is easily digestible. You can start there. That goes back to the why and the mission statement and the vision planning before you even talk about financing, before you talk about build outs, before you talk about services and fee structures. I think this is the starting point. And to go along with that, um, the book E-Myth, I think everyone should read before they go into business ownership, because I think it's a good filter to try to figure out if you truly are an entrepreneur and want to be a practice owner, or if you just think it's sexy and cool and like the next best thing. Business ownership is not for everyone, and you could save yourself a few hundred thousand dollars just by figuring out if it's for you or not, right? Additionally to that, though, I do want to caveat because I am sure there are a lot of people out there, correct me if I'm wrong, that are curious enough about business ownership that even if they don't think that they would love it, they might never forgive themselves if they didn't try. If that's the case, then I think it's worth a few hundred thousand dollars to learn that about yourself or have regrets at the end of life. So e is good to filter out if you should do this or not, if you're on the fence and you're just feeling pressured to own something. And then Becoming Supernatural, Big Magic, Unfuck Your Brain, and Code of the Extraordinary Mind are all good almost mindset books that help get you thinking more like an entrepreneur and less like an associate with big picture ideas, if that makes sense. Okay. I want to jump back to um, just some comments in the chat. First of all, people are very, very impressed with what you've built there with your dry eye med spa. And then to your question about, you know, where's everybody from? It went from medical school in Cincinnati to Los Angeles. Okay. Costa Rica. I'm going to Costa Rica soon. Uh, if you're going to uh, Costa Rica, definitely uh, chat up uh, Francisco. He, he says, greetings, Carly. Greetings, but, Francisco. <laughs> as we go further, Saudi Arabia and Australia. I'd have to, I'm not great at geography, so I, I'm not sure who wins. Who which is wins, the but those are pretty, those are pretty 180. So that is really awesome what we're able to do here with this virtual event is we're, we're really impacting dry eye 
patient care all throughout the world. I'm just so proud of that. I love it. And I'm kind of going to touch on that in a second, but I agree. That is mind blowing. Okay. I will go to the next little topic here, which is capital. I think that this is usually a big elephant in the room. How much is it going to cost? What, how much am I going to go into debt? What's the profit margin? How much can we charge and benchmarking? So I will only be able to speak on my journey. So I'll tell you exactly what I did. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. In, in retrospect, I may actually have done things a little bit differently, but this is what we did, right? So for my startup costs, I had to get an acquisition loan to purchase my sister's practice. And that just went through tr traditional banking. And then what I did was, I, like I said, I slowly built my dry eye clinic within those four walls under that LLC. So I would purchase kind of one piece of equipment at a time every six to 12 months until I got to the point where I was literally exploding out of the walls and we had to move. So it's been a slow build for me financially. Um, and so it's kind of like tack on a little bit of an expense to be able to grow the revenue, tack on another expense, grow the revenue. And it's been a stair-step process, which has led me to be able to open this space at a relatively low cost because I had already done the in, um, technology investment for the most part. And then when I got to this space, all I really needed to do was build out in furniture and computers, which still added up to be quite a bit, but not nearly as if I had to then also buy multiple pieces of equipment all at once. So whichever way you go, I'm not even saying that cold starts wrong. I think there's pros and cons to both. You could absolutely do traditional financing, uh, find your space, do the market research, give the business plan that we were talking about, uh, about, I think I'm going to need this piece of equipment for this much money, bundle it all into one loan. And that is another way to do it. Now with profit margins, um, I think that this is probably the biggest push for specialty within primary care and optometry in general. I think it will come to no surprise that profit margins in traditional optometry are just shrinking. Insurance reimbursement is decreasing. Uh, uh, Ecom is getting better and better. And it's, we're kind of, uh, it's a race to the bottom, in my opinion, in primary care. Now, I think it's still important to have stellar primary care, which is why I still have a pri private practice, a primary care private practice, because I, I think that that diversity within optometry is very healthy. So I believe in that as well. But I think specializing is wildly important for the success of our profession as the margins shrink on traditional private practice, typical glasses, contact lenses. Now, I take the glass half full perspective. I think this pressure from outside industry is actually a good thing. I think pressure from e-com is a good thing. I think we will only get better as we are forced to. So I am... I think it's great. Now, profit margin on this specialty specifically is pretty high startup, right? These pieces of equipment are very, very expensive. But on the flip side, there's no consumables. There's no, well, there's limited consumables, right? Limited consumables and cost of goods and no very limited insurance involvement as well, which makes life easier for all of us. But another thing to think about that I didn't necessarily think about at the beginning is with specialization and with charging these higher fees that are out of pocket to patients, you really need an excellent staff. So your payroll is likely to increase, especially with providers that are skilled in these specialties, they're going to require an increased dollar amount. So while your expenses may be lower, your startup fees and payroll are likely higher. And then benchmarking, right? So this is kind of a new industry. It's tricky to benchmark against typical private practice, primary care optometry. So what have I done to help me facilitate all of these? Um, a lot of financing 
for the pieces of equipment, I have gotten from the companies directly. They will work with you very easily to get you money to get these machines in your hand. So that's actually been silly easy to get money for equipment. I think maybe it should actually be a little bit harder. Um, so work with them on equipment financing, usually really good rates and terms and six to 12 months, no payments as you get your feet wet. They will also work with you on pricing the services and packages together based on your area. Those services are built into their selling fee, right? They know that they should have good post-op support. And so lean on them for how much should we be charging in the, and um, how should we be bundling these together to be the most successful. And they should help you with margins as well. I also look outside of industry at different markets. So I also will do things like look at med spas and their margins now because this is a little bit different than primary care. And then, like I said, you can go the traditional banking route for sure. There's no right or wrong. It's just a matter of doing the thing. I think we often get hung up in the details when that's just an excuse to not do the thing. And then this is a list of books that have helped me in the financial world. Profit First is a great way to run a business. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is kind of a good crash course on finances in general. The Science of Getting Rich, I Will Teach You to Be Rich, Think and Grow Rich, and those three are more of the mentality of money as, um, as you know, value exchange and wrapping your head around actual... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Commerce. Actually, it's, it's an exchange of goods, right? Looking at it as that is very helpful. And then the book Never Split the Difference is a book on negotiation, which I find very valuable in working with sales reps. Number one, you always want to negotiate. They expect to negotiate. They're sales agents. And I don't think optometrists are very good at negotiation. So it's a skill to practice. And it's a skill that I also think is valuable that I did not anticipate in the chair with the patient trying to help convince them of things like home therapies for compliance and increased results. That's a bit of a negotiation. And so that has actually helped me in multiple areas. So Dr. Rose, I'm gonna negotiate with you just briefly. If you promise to call me Damon for the rest of the session, I promise that I'm gonna come down and visit your dream dry eye center in Cincinnati very soon. Deal, then we can do that, we can do that. Like you said, this is a casual Friday night fireside chat, right? So we can do first name basis. Uh, a comment from um, Susan is you're an inspiration for lady eye doctors that I made the point is I think Carly's really an inspiration for everybody in this space. So thanks again. I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I don't feel comfortable on that pedestal. So I will humbly just say thank you. Um, I'll just keep going and keep trying to make you guys proud, right? Okay, so technologies, I get this a question a lot, what to buy, when to buy it, where to start. And so I will take you through the timeline chronologically of what I purchased my, and why my thought process, but know again that this is not necessarily the right way. This, this partially had to do with um, market timing, what was available, right? Because right now we have so many more technologies available that we did four years ago when I started to dip my toes in this industry. So what I bought is indic indicative of what I knew then, what was available then, and how it all shook out. So you, you can mostly look at these pieces in two different categories, diagnostic and, tr and therapeutic treatments. So my very first piece I purchased, and like I said, this is unbranded and non-CE, so we can have full open conversations about which companies and um, good stuff that we don't have to worry about uh, disclosures. So the very first piece I bought was a LipaFlow and LipaScan combo. I actually always wanted a LipaFlow because I did. it was one of the few dry eye technologies that's been available since I've been practicing. 
And I just thought it was gold standard. It still is gold standard. I, I didn't even question my decision. I didn't look at other thermal pulsation um, options. I decided if I wanted to be the best, I wanted to have the best. And I just went essentially name brand, right? And that um, obviously came with my, my, my biographer, the Lipis scan, which kind of rocked my socks off. And that is also when I started implementing a standardized questionnaire because um, Tier Science, now Johnson & Johnson, suggests the speed score. They give you speed score um, templates, and I just ran with that. And I think that made a huge difference in my success. I started screening everyone on my biography at that time, 18 and up. I have decreased it down to 12 and up, all comprehensive eye exams. That still happens. Even though I pulled all of my dry eye technology out of my primary care office, I actually left my Lipiscan down there to continue that screener because I think it is an important piece of a comprehensive eye exam. So that opened the conversation. I started speed scoring and we slowly brought that habit in with my staff. And my next purchase um, was the Oculus because I just wanted further diagnostics. The Oculus brought to me, it didn't actually change my treatment paradigm. What it did for me was showed the patients their actual eyeball and that gave all the buy-in. Then our conversion rates went through the roof because the patient could see what was actually happening with their eyes. So I think diagnostics are so important, obviously to plan your treatment track, but most important I think is for the patient buy-in. And then after Oculus, I per so funny story, my next purchase was um, Lipo, uh, I'm sorry, IPL. I got the Luminous M22 IPL, and that was a piece that I actually wanted for about a year and a half. I had been studying it. I had been consuming anything I could find on it. I started identifying all of my dry eye patients that I thought could benefit from it. I went as far as having the sales rep bring the... M22 into my office two or three different times. And the fact of the matter is, I just thought it wouldn't fit. So keep in mind, 750 square feet, full optical field, OCT, Optos, now Lipoflow, Lipiscan, two exam lanes. I had no idea where this giant R2D2 of a machine was going to go. And anyway, what happened is I brought it on almost out of ethical obligation. I had all of these patients that I felt needed an IPL and nowhere to send them. And so the closest place was a couple hours away. So I was, I, I basically put all of my equipment on wheels and started playing Tetris with them and moving them around as needed. And we made it work. And I actually wish I had not waited a year and a half. I wish I had jumped on that one sooner because that blew the top off of things. When I found that when I put IPL, um, decreasing inflammation together with thermal pul pulsation, even though the treatment package almost tripled, everyone was saying yes, everyone was getting results, everyone loved the aesthetic benefit, which kind of shocked me because I... When I was talking with the sales reps, I actually was not interested in the aesthetic piece at all because I wanted to be taken seriously in this space. I'm already a young female and I just wanted to drive home the fact that I really was interested in dry eye, the disease. And so I'm doing my dry eye treatments and patients are starting to ask me about the aesthetic benefits and patients are starting to ask me about things like skincare and cosmetics and lash treatments. And so because I, I truly believe because of that device, I started looking into the aesthetic world. And what's fascinating to me is all through optometry school, we kind of chatted about the fact that the eye is an extension of the brain. But what we've never touched on is that the eyelids are an extension of the skin. So we really do need to look at this as a combo ophthalmic dermatologic space. And that's where my paradigm, my thought process just blew up because I'm looking now, now I have my own skincare line and now I carry eye-friendly cosmetics and I'm hiring a nurse practitioner to do safe injectables that aren't going to interfere with link reflex. And it's just been a wild ride. 
And then after my IPO, I purchased, I think the next thing was radio frequency. It was because I would have never considered radio frequency prior to IPL because I already had a lipoflow. I already had this thermal biography or my Bohmian gland evacuator. Why would I need another one? Plus it's another gigantic machine and it's very expensive. Um, what happened for me is I knew the power of the aesthetic side through IPL. And so the fact that this had an aesthetic side effect, it piqued my interest and I heard the company out and I went for it. So that was my next piece. Then we opened the dry eye med spa and I invested in tear lab and firefly, I think is where we are right now, technology wise. Again, that's my timeline. That doesn't mean it, it's the right timeline, but it worked out for me. Hey, Carly, I've got, I asked a question in the chat just to kind of um, add some spice to this. You know, what is the first dry equipment you purchased? Josh said the 5M. Sean said the Antares and IPAN Osmolarity. Ryan said the 5M. Uh, Jennifer said the 5M in Tier Lab. So I thought that was interesting. And I, you know, I think thinking through, you know, that 750 square foot space, I mean, you spent a couple hundred thousand dollars into getting exactly what you wanted. Was there ever any sort of fear in putting that sort of investment in that small of a space? Or did you have this dream years ago, knowing where you were going to go, kind of how did that evolve? Okay, so one of the books I think I listed already, and if not, it might be on a hidden slide that we're not going to see now because of the poll. So I'll go ahead and give it to you now. There's a book called Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And it's this idea, um, it's kind of defying the starving artist, which how does that make sense? We'll come full circle in a second. But her big, her, her concept in that book is that these ideas come through us and we don't need to take ownership in them, right? It, it, our ego wants to own these ideas. This idea was not exclusively mine. It came through me. It is now must happen, but that has to do with that vision planning, right? The deeper in detail you can get and the more emotionally connected you can get, the further it's going to propel you into this. But you're right, that's a lot of money and it was actually a lot more than that dollar amount to invest in such a tiny square footage. But there was nowhere for me to send my patients, right? So I, it's almost like I had to do it. I had to do it. I mean, I, mean, I feel you there. I've got a second dry eye center we're building up in Lafayette, which is about an hour north of here, and just being there a couple months, and I don't have IPL yet. I've got other technologies with tear care, Hilux, Flefex, diagnostics with tear lab and flam and dry, but not having that IPL for me now. I mean, I'm I'm sending people to Indianapolis weekly. It's like mm -hmm. I, that's a must-have for me and what I'm doing. Absolutely, and uh, it's interesting that many people their first their first pieces of equipment were diagnostic. So the question is, you find it, where, what are you going to do with it? Where are you going to send them? And for me, the answer was nowhere. And so I, to be treated the way I thought, right? I can send you out to a specialist that's going to give you doxy and azocyte and hot compresses. I can do that. I need these procedures. And so, so, so where do you go, right? How, who do you ask about this stuff? Um, and what to buy first and when to buy it and what's a good fair price and how much are you charging and are patients saying yes because this seems like a lot of money um, and honestly as much as I despise Facebook I think it is the dumpster fire of the internet their groups are very beneficial um, there's an OS docs group on that's really active really supportive you can use these Facebook groups as a search engine that's how I use them. So if I have a question about, say, an M22, I will get on ODs on Facebook and search M22. I will get on OS Docs and search M22. Um, to, so those are obviously optometry-based. 
but there are also dry eye patient support groups on there that I find are invaluable. So dry eye patients are brilliant. And that's why I think it's important to don't dabble in this field, really know your stuff because the patients do. And this, the things they share with each other globally on these support groups is kind of mind blowing. Damon, I don't know if you've ever been on these, but they are very impressive. And so I am also a, an observer in these patient groups. I want to caveat because I, it makes me a little nervous telling other doctors to do this because I really want these spaces to be a protected space for patients to also be able to vent about their doctors, right? And be able to vent about their disease and the struggles they're going through. And I don't think we should go in there and kind of take over the conversation. I think we should politely listen, observe, help this community and chime in where we can, but mostly just observe from, from those perspectives. In my opinion, that's kind of been a sacred space. I've avoided that. Yes. And I know that I have quite a few referrals that come in to ASL on the Facebook group. I don't yeah. know how many people didn't come in to see me because they saw something negative. I guess that's possible. But, um, you know, I've, I've stayed away from that intentionally. I do engage with the other, uh, you know, doctor-focused groups that you spoke of, but the patient ones I've just stayed away with myself. Uh, Carly, uh, as we're talking about technology and, you know, people are adding RF and things of that nature, there's a couple of questions about low-level light therapy. Was that something that was ever Yes, so sorry. We, we have that too. So sorry. I knew I was forgetting things, and I probably still am. Um, low-level light therapy is one I've just ever so slightly dabbled in because I am such a big IPL user and believer. Uh, but I think there's a benefit, especially because of the aesthetic side. So that's actually why I... Um, brought it on is because there's this crossover and anything where there's a crossover, I am all in. And so I do have it. I am just beta testing patients right now to see where it does fit in with IPL, with RF, with home therapies. So right now I'm beta testing it, but I, I think it has a place in this industry. Great. And then I also took Crystal Brimer's Dry Eye Institute and Shadowing Doctors. So as Damon said, we're only a couple hours apart. He can, he can personally attest to how many times I've called and text him questions about what to do where all through this process. Dr. Karpecki uh, humbly allows me to observe whenever I ask, which I am honored. Um, and just ask around. I think... There should be no gatekeeping in this industry because rising tides lifts all boats and in us teaching each other how we are successful is what's going to push not only the industry forward, but also this specialty diving into subspecialties. As you can see, not only am I doing dry eye, I'm adding in aesthetics, which is such a weird thing. It's nothing we ever learned in school. And the only way to learn is from talking to each other. So I highly recommend that. <laughs> One more question in this space. Uh, Vanessa asks, how do you decide when to use IPL versus low-level light therapy versus radio frequency or some combination of those? Or Lipiflow or Ilux. I know that's yeah, really the confusing lot. part, right? I have all of those. So the way I typically do it is I put it together in a package for IPL and one thermal pulsation option. I let the patient choose if you want on-label Lipiflow or off-label RF. I will go over what I think. If I am leaning towards, say, RF for lid laxity purposes, I will say, these are your two options. If I were you, I would do RF because you have conchalasis or lid laxity and an incomplete blink. So I would lean towards this. However, it's not FDA approved. It's likely to never be FDA approved because this is an aesthetic company and they don't really care, right? Now, IPL, if they have inflammation, I'm straight to it. Uh, LLLT is the piece that I am not sure. So right now I have a handful of patients that are really flexible with me and they know that like I'm exploring this space and learning as I go. And so they're cool with beta testing. Most of the time I will offer it for free and just get their feedback and see where it fits in. So I am still in exploration phase of LLLT, but I have the Saluma. Got it. Uh, yeah, let's move forward here because we only have 10 minutes left in this session. Okay, let's go fast. Right? 
So we wanted to, perfect timing because we're on the last space and I want to leave some a little bit of Q&A time. So like I said, I have subspecialized in dry eye and aesthetics because I think it's a natural fit. And I needed to learn about things like cosmetics and aesthetic offerings like lash extensions and lash serums. All of these things cause dry eye. So you can offer aesthetic services without being in the dry eye space. I know plenty of optometrists that will do um, lashes, tattoo liner, and a million other things that could potentially cause dry eye, right? I think we all agree that lash extensions, lash serums like Latisse and liner tattoos all have the potential to cause dry eye. I will personally never offer those because I only want to offer mutually beneficial services. So IPL helps both. RF helps both. The lid hygienes I choose nourish lashes, healthy mascaras. So there is a massive crossover. So this is where I say you have the vision, you have the technologies, you have the financing. Now what? This is specializing even further. This is where you can really, really niche down and set yourself apart. And the world is your oyster as long as you're willing to face that fear. So Damon, I'm about said Dr. Durker, you said to me, Weren't you afraid investing multiple six figures into a 700 square foot office? Because that will absolutely cut us off at the knees. We are, we were doing RFs in our waiting room behind like an Amazon fake, like, um, foldable wall. It was ridiculous. It was not spa-like. It was not ideal, but people are hungry for these healthy services, the aesthetic aspect with the dry eye therapies. Uh, to me, the fact that I was successful in that setting main meant that I just have to be successful here, right? No, that's so, great. I love it. A couple books, Becoming a Category of One and Positioning, both have that concept of really niching down, when to hit the market. I listen to as many, I probably listen to more med spa podcasts now than optometry, right? Optometry is old hat. We know what we're doing here. This is a whole new space for me. So I am learning as if it is day, it is day one, and I'm learning all that I can Always making sure you know that you don't know everything is helpful. I also am a member of AMSPA, which is the American Med Spa Association. So I can go to med spa conferences on how to build a med spa. I think the important thing is to have the fear. Know it's real. We all have fear, but do it anyway. You have to take the action. And then APEX, APX, that is um, kind of like business consultants for med spas. So they have been fairly low dollar, huge value add as I'm doing this startup process, right? And so with that, a little bit of Q&A we'll leave time for, and then this is a way to get a hold of me. So if I breezed through a topic very quickly, um, just message me and we can chat further. So Rochelle asks, if you were to go back in time, what would be the first piece of equipment you would buy? And you've already told that story. Is that still the right choice for you going back in time or is that a fair going, going back in time, I think that it did work out. Um, I think IPL is a really easy first investment because it is successful. Um, what I usually say is I do have a handful of patients that I think only need IPL. Most of my patients need IPL and thermal pulsation, and I don't really have very many at all that just needs thermal pulsation. That's, mu that's the much smaller demographic. Now, is there a time and a place for any of them anyway? Yes. Would I have flip-flopped IPL and Lipoflow? Maybe. However, I'm very glad I had the mybographer with the Lipoflow because I do believe mybography right at the beginning is a great tool. Lynn wants to know what your favorite eye-friendly makeup line is. Okay, so um, Eyes Are the Story is a really good one. And then 2020 Beauty is another good one. Christina asks, are you offering aesthetic treatments full face or limiting it around the eyes? So I myself and my associate, Dr. Burt, are exclusively honing in on dry eye. We don't market. We don't upcharge aesthetics. We don't do any of that. 
We are bringing on a nurse practitioner and a medical director. They're both in the queues waiting. We just have to line out all these logistics that you don't ever realize are a thing um, to do aesthetics with the IPL. So she will, this, uh, my service provider will maximize my pieces of equipment that I have now on within her scope, right? So I can't play with the settings and do the um, hyperpigmentation or the hair removal. So this machine does so much more than our Ohio laws allow. Um, so because of that, what I'm doing, my workaround is getting a medical director and getting a nurse practitioner to be able to maximize the aesthetic side of these, these machines and then layer in injectables and peels and microneedling and PRP and all of the things. So but to answer your question, I do not, but I will have staff that does. Uh, we answered Rochelle's question. Heather, that's a tough one. Would you pick Oculus or Lithoscan if you had to choose one? If you had to choose one, I'm going to go rogue here and go Lithoscan. Why is that rogue? Because so many dry eye docs are obsessed with the 5M. And I agree. It is great. It really is. But the it's to me, quantity over quality in that decision making because the Lipiscan can capture so many more people very quickly, tech friendly, easy to incorporate in a comprehensive eye exam, and you're going to cast a wider net. Great pearl there. Favorite med spa podcast. Okay, so Terry Ross is the owner of um, Apex. Let me see what her podcast is called because she is a boss. She has ran med spas in Beverly Hills for years. I believe she was Marky Mark's backup dancer. So that's interesting. Obviously, she's female. I love a strong female. We touched on that. Uh, let me see. I, I just was listening to her podcast earlier today. So it's very fresh in my mind. Here we go. It is... In Touch with Terry is a good one. In Touch with Terry. Yep. Favorite Med Spa podcast. Uh, are you, I have not been paid deal? by any of these companies. I need to throw that out there. I, um, I, I do actually, I wanted to tell you guys that part of the technology buy-in, I think it is really important to talk to other doctors that are using these pieces to ensure that there is good post-sale support. You don't want a company that sells you a product and then leaves and you never hear from them again. You want the training, you want the confidence, you want the pricing structure, marketing tips and tricks. So make sure whenever you're investing in, in a piece of equipment that the company offers good post-sale support. I Irene is wondering if you are still using Lipiflow with some of the reimbursement things that we're seeing. Is that is that part of what's happening in Ohio? Um, I have not seen any reimbursement issues. I know, Damon, you and I have talked about this quite a bit. I have not been affected by that at all. My Lipiflow usage has gone down significantly with me implementing RF, and I'm okay with that. But actually, I'm holding on to Lipiflow in case of decent insurance reimbursement to be able to offer some insurance services for patients that are really tight on funds. No, I mean, I, I love that you're doing so much now, but you're still thinking two, three, five years down the road because we're going to be treating dry eye as the majority of what we do as optometrists for the rest of our careers. I have no doubt about that. And, and that's, yeah, that's my most exciting piece of this space is I have three or four rooms totally open to daydream and play. And I know you and I have talked about biomarkers and blood workups and nutrition therapies. I think that we are just beginning in this space. That is awesome. Any final thoughts as we wrap up this session, Carly? Again, I just wanted to thank you. I want to thank anybody that's stuck with us this whole time on a Friday night. I am forever honored. Thank you, Carly. Uh, how to build your very own dream dry eye center, Dr. Carly Rose in Cincinnati, Ohio. It's been a great session. Stick around. Or go to the exhibit hall if you'd like. We'll be back here in about 15 minutes with how to implement a dry eye protocol in a surgical practice. Thank you.